Our author this evening is Seth Graham Smith. His debut novel, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, uh, was a New York Times bestseller and sold over one million copies. His current book, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter, for which we are here this evening, debuted at number four on the New York Times bestseller list. He's written several nonfiction books as well, including How to Survive a Horror Movie uh, and the much funnier than it sounds uh, book of porn. I don't think we're going to have a program on that. Um, he's also the creator, uh, co-creator and executive producer of the MTV comedy series The Hard Times of R.J. Berger. And uh, the uh, news for this evening is that Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter uh, will be a major motion picture. It is being co-produced by Tim Burton. I think you all know him, so that should be a very interesting, very interesting uh, movie. Uh, anyway, uh, there will be a question uh, answer period after his lecture, and then we will be selling books and um, signing them in the atrium outside the um, uh, auditorium. Without further ado, Seth Graham Smith, author of Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Uh, thank you for that introduction. It makes me sound much more important than I really am. Hello, Mike and Trinity, my friends from out of town. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming on this rainy uh, weekday. Um, it's like, I, I notice it's kind of like Los Angeles, Atlanta. When it rains just a little bit, it's just chaos on the roads. Nobody's used to the weather. Um, so I'm glad you all made it here safe. I want to start... Um, by just reading uh, about a page from the book. Uh, this is when Abe uh, is in New Orleans. Uh, and then I'll talk to about how the book came to be. And then, you know, I'd love to hear questions as soon as you have them, because uh, I like to Q&A rather than just talk at you guys for, uh, for 30, 40 minutes. So uh, this is when Abe uh, meets. He's in New Orleans, and uh, he's hungover, which, OK. Um, uh, and uh, he notices someone keeps, uh, keeps looking at him. So, uh, so he gives chase, uh, and he meets someone who will become very important in his life. Uh, and we begin. They turned onto Dauphine Street and were gone, but the feeling of invading eyes remained. This time, the source was plain as day. I spotted a pale little fellow across the street, half hidden in an alley, his eyes unquestionably fixed on me. He was dressed entirely in black with a mess of hair to match and a small mustache beneath his dark glasses, unmistakably a vampire. Seeing that he had been discovered, the figure turned and disappeared into the alley. This I could not leave uninvestigated. Aching head be damned, I left my friend to his own stumbling and hastened after this stranger, chasing him down the alley into Conti Street, then Basin Street, where the devil sought refuge behind the cemetery walls. I had been no more than ten paces behind him, but on reaching the gates, I perceived him not. He had vanished, lost in a maze of crypts. I wondered if he had simply slipped into one of them, wondered how many vampires were, and what mean you by chasing me so, sir? I spun around and raised my fists. He was behind me, his back against the inside of the cemetery wall, clever devil, staring at me, his dark glasses in his fingers, his tired eyes, and his high forehead. Chasing you, sir? I, what meant you by running? Well, sir, the manner in which you shielded your eyes from the light, the familiar glance you shared with the gentleman in the coach, I thought you a vampire. I could scarcely believe what I had heard. You thought me a vampire, he asked, but I... A smile grew over the little man's lips. He looked at the dark glasses in his finger, at the, at the look on this tall stranger's face, and he began to laugh. I believe us both guilty of grave misjudgments. Forgive me, sir, but am I to understand that you are not a vampire? Reg regrettably no, he said, laughing, or I should still have my breath. I offered my apology and extended my hand. Abe Lincoln, the little man took it. Edgar Poe. <laughs> so that's the uh, story of how Abe and Edgar become good vampire hunting buddies in, uh, in this preposterous uh, book. Uh, so how did this book come to... Uh, to be, and uh, why does anybody care about it? The second part, I have no idea. Why do any of you, any of you care about it? I don't know, but I'm glad you do. Uh, I can only tell you how it came to be. Um, it was a couple of years ago, and uh, this is as I was uh, writing Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, um, 
I, uh, one of the things I like to do is I like to wander into bookstores, big bookstores, small bookstores, um, and uh, see what's out there, see what's on the tables, see what's on the shelves, pull things down, read other people's work, and see what I can, you know, steal. Uh, and I just noticed that about, about two years ago, as we were leading up to the bicentennial of Abraham Lincoln's birth, uh, there seemed to be a, a, a Lincoln table in the front of every single bookstore that I went into, and a new Lincoln biography of some sort, you know, Lincoln and his horse, Lincoln and his law practice, Lincoln and his, you know, hat collection. Um, everything Lincoln was coming out on an almost weekly basis. And uh, lo and behold, this is also about the time in uh, publishing history that the Twilight phenomenon is reaching its critical mass. Now, I have not read any of the Twilight books, and I am happy to say that my vampires do not sparkle. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I, you know, I also think that uh, it's high time we got back to killing vampires as, as opposed to kissing vampires, but that's, that's entirely beside the point. What, what I'm getting at is that there would also be a vampire table in the front of all of these bookstores, big and small. And, you know, I kept wandering into the bookstores and vampire table, Lincoln table, Lincoln table, vampire table. And one of these days, just what I call the Reese's peanut butter cup moment happened. <laughs> And I thought to myself, well, what if these two great tastes taste even better together? <laughs> um, that was enough of the aha moment for me to sort of uh, think, you know, I just thought about it superficially. Okay, Abraham Lincoln and vampires. I, you know, I, I was already working on Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, so I sort of had this mashup mentality going on already, which is, I think, why I was, you know, even considered it in the first place. But uh, it got me investigating the real life of Abraham Lincoln. And, which is something I'd only done on a superficial level before. You know, we all grew up hearing, uh, you know, the tales of Honest Abe and Four Score and Seven Years and the Top Hat and Ford's Theater. And we all, I think, have, as Americans, a, a basic sort of fundamental knowledge of Lincoln and his life and the lore surrounding this, this beloved man. But as I delved in a little deeper, I, I was struck by the tragedy of this man's life the ceaseless tragedy, um, the death that, uh, that haunted him his entire life. He buried his little brother, he buried his mother, he buried his first love, he buried his older sister, he buried two of his sons. Um, never did a, a two-year period go by in his life after he's nine years old where, you know, he doesn't lose something or someone uh, 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 that he loves. And yet, uh, he continually picks himself up dusts himself off, and, and carries on. Um, not just carries on, but thrives. And that was the thing that really struck me, is the more I read about Lincoln, uh, I read a couple of biographies, including the great Doris Kearns Goodwin biography. I read a book called uh, Abraham Lincoln, President-Elect by Harold Holzer, who's a great um, uh, Lincoln scholar. Um, I read Lincoln's letters. I read his uh, correspondence, you know, to try to get a sense of how he thought and how he expressed himself on paper and in public. And... Uh, Here's a man, uh, once this whole picture of Abraham Lincoln came together in my mind, uh, I had sort of fallen for the guy. You know, by the, by the time a two-month period of research went by, I had sort of been hooked. Uh, whether I was going to write this book or not, I had been hooked by Lincoln and his story, by the man. Uh, not the myth, but the man. And, uh, and you know, the genius um, that allowed him to pick himself up with no family name to trade on, not a penny to his name, uh, no education to speak of, really, uh, to pick himself up, educate himself, get himself out of uh, Indiana and Kentucky and Illinois and into the White House. And not only get himself into the White House, but to actually use that office uh, in, in the time uh, of our nation's deepest uh, crisis and to reconcile that crisis. So, you know, I, I, I loved the guy. And, uh, and I knew I needed to write the story, and, uh, and I knew I needed to do it respectfully because not only did I love the guy, but a lot of people love the guy. And, you know, the one thing you want to avoid doing when writing any book about Lincoln is making him look bad, even when you're writing about him slaying vampires. So I endeavored to uh, make him look cool uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, kind of badass, you know, and, uh, and, but then keep the, keep the spirit of, uh, his ideals, the spirit of the man, the personality of the man, and as much fact of the man's life in the book as I possibly could. Um, and, and that's 
that's what I set out to do. And uh, after a couple of months of, of sort of intense research, um, I wrote the book in a, in a period of about four months, uh, and then began sort of editing process with uh, my editor at, at the publishing company. And uh, lo and behold, here we are. And uh, it seems to be doing well. So people, uh, people seem to have responded to it. Um, Again, I don't know why. It's uh, I'm happy that they did, but uh, but uh, I'm I'm thrilled to be here with you guys. And uh, and if you're thinking of questions, soon will be the time that I ask you to ask them. And you don't necessarily have to come up to the microphone, although you're happy to. You're welcome to, but you can raise your hand or yell it out. Or and this gentleman is jumping right on it. Yes, sir. Well, that's true. Um, I, you know, if if. Uh, well, by by that uh, you know uh, by that stretch, I mean almost every president becomes a great killer. You know, every president connected to a war. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, I mean Truman, Roosevelt. You know, uh, certainly responsible for 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 more deaths, I think, at war than Lincoln. But uh, I love the South. That's how I'd answer that question. And I'm happy to be here. <laughs> and in the spirit of Lincoln, I think, you know, let us not uh, dwell on our differences. <laughs> I, as a Connecticut-born, Boston-educated Yankee, <laughs> and you all, as the wonderful people of this great state of Georgia. Um, uh, another question. Anyone, please feel free to shout them out. Um, you two, I'm looking to to bail me out of this because I know you, and you, you know, we uh, we used to live in Los Angeles together until they had the good sense to leave. Yes, sir. Well, yes and no. Um, the, the the question is the it does. It, the question was, um, do I do I point out things uh, criticisms of Lincoln, such as the fact that he sort of he doesn't attempt to avoid the Civil War and that he destroys the concept of states' rights. I would argue that Buchanan was largely, his predecessor was largely responsible for the lead up to the war. It was sort of, you know, the country was already in the 1850s, the turbulent 1850s, tearing itself apart on the question of states' rights and, um, and of compromise and of, uh, you know, or lack thereof on the slavery issue. Uh, you know, Buchanan sort of leaves uh, office, you know, pushing this issue down the road. You know, there's the Dred Scott uh, decision, which uh, you know only makes things worse. And you know, Buchanan, um, Buchanan actually in his inaugural speech, I believe, in his, uh, says, you know, uh, well, let the courts decide this issue. Um, he's sort of a non. He's one of, to me, the worst president of all time, and he's the least presidential of the presidents, uh, in the sense that he sort of wants the judiciary to, you know, to take all the responsibility for the fact that the, the country is uh, is beginning to tear itself apart. Um, as to the question of states' rights, eh, you know, um, the, the fact is I, don't, I, couldn't, I couldn't answer that intelligently enough to attempt an answer. Um, you know, I, I know I've heard the criticism before, but uh, uh, being a guy who writes about Lincoln fighting vampires and being an actual Lincoln scholar and historian are two very different things. So I will leave the second half of that question to the real smart people. Uh, this gentleman again, and I, I and now I'm really afraid. Um, no, I hadn't. We have. Yes. Uh, there's a uh, the, the the question the question of, of Lincoln and homosexuality um, is is more of a recent you know uh, I think it was I, don't, I think it was in the 90s actually there was a book uh, which is about Lincoln and his you know. Uh, sharing a bed, not just with Joshua Speed when they lived together above uh, Speed's general store in Springfield, but but also with uh, with some of his field marshals, his generals and things when he was out visiting the troops. When you know the argument is that well he, he was the president and he had all of these options for where to stay. Why then does he share a bed with so and so? Um, again, uh, you know we're, the, the distinction between real history and vampire history you know, I think is an important one. And, uh, and my focus is on Lincoln uh, and his dealings with the undead uh, and not the unwed. <laughs> so, yes, uh, yes, ma'am, in the, uh, behind you, you're next, and yes, you, yes. Um, well, you know, it's, the question is, uh, you know, the, on the, well, on the, on the 
nonfiction side and the biography side, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a huge nonfiction lover. I love the works of David McCullough, of Doris Kearns Goodwin, of Walter Isaacson. Um, and then on the fiction side, I grew up uh, as a science fiction and horror nerd, basically, and reading Ray Bradbury and reading Asimov and Stephen King. And, uh, you know, and, and so, I, again, it's this sort of Reese's Peanut Butter Cup melding of these two loves that I have, um, writing what is essentially a horror book in the style of a biography, a presidential biography. And uh, my vampire influences run the gamut. I mean, I also read The Vampire Chronicles by Anne Rice when I was a kid, or at least the first three, I think, and, I, and then I gave it up. But, uh, um, uh, and then, um, you know, Bram Stoker's original story. I mean, just the, the fact that so much of the original, uh, of Bram Stoker's uh, novel is... is uh, told through letters and a lot of this book is told through letters and uh, and y you know it's it's one of it's the original and still probably the best of the of the vampire stories and um, so in putting together the vampires for this book I I like to say I paid homage to but really that's just author code for stealing you know I stole uh, some of those great vampire characteristics and added a few of my own and yes I promise you were next well, um, you know, uh, again, it, by, by stealing what works and then by adding a little bit of, of my own stuff to, to that mix. And one of the things that I knew early on about, uh, about my vampires, I didn't want Abraham Lincoln's vampire hunting uh, or vampire associating to be limited to darkness. Uh, I just thought it would be interesting if, if vampires could, in some cases, go out during the daytime. So what I concocted for this book was uh, that over a period of, say, about a century, uh, Vampires can, through gradual exposure, sort of build up a tolerance to sunlight. Never an immunity. Uh, it still makes them quite uncomfortable uh, if they're standing in the sun too long. You'll still see them wearing dark glasses because their eyes never quite adjust and carrying parasols and, and all of those things. And, uh, you know, it's never a very comfortable situation for them. But by the time a vampire, you know, at least in this mythology, reaches their second century and beyond, they can, they can exist in limited periods of time in the sun. And... That was also, you know, because I knew where the story was going, and I knew that there were certain very important events in the book um, that I won't ruin where a vampire needs to be out during the day. And you, sir. What got me interested in writing? Um, I was, basically the movies did, really. I mean, I was 9 or 10 when I, when I decided I love movies. Uh, I, don't know, I didn't know what that meant, but I love movies, and I want to work in movies or do something movie-related. Um, and slowly but surely what happened is I found that the way that I, my way into that was by writing. Um, I guess reading also more than anything got me interested in writing. Uh, the, the aforementioned Bradbury, King, Asimov, you know, early on, especially King when I was a teenager, you know, Teenage Boys and Stephen King, and, you know, was, you know I mean, that was my candy when I was a kid. And, um, and uh, I was lucky enough that uh, I had a stepfather who used a, used, uh, ran a used and rare bookshop uh, in Connecticut and uh, who had 5,000 volumes uh, or, uh, books in our basement arranged in a converted basement on shelves. And every, every year for my birthday, I would get a first edition of, a, of the new Stephen King book uh, for my birthday. And, uh, and so I started collecting books early on and, and reading them and rereading them. And... Uh, um, and that was sort of my writing school uh, until I went to college and sort of took formal uh, creative writing classes and learned how to put that all together. But even before that, um, I remember my mother was in graduate school and I was very young and she had these blue exam books, you know, those little pencil books that you take your exams in. And she would bring home a stack of those for me and I would um, just arbitrarily write a title on the cover of one and then start with a big pencil writing a story based on that title. Um, which is actually a practice that continues to this day where I think of a title first and then I write a book around it. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Um, so uh, that's, you know, reading and writing is what got me interested in writing um, and the fact that I didn't get sick of it after years. Um, yes, sir, in the, in the very back. Oh, how I stumbled across the journal. Well, you can read all about it in the introduction, but uh, I, was, uh, I was working at a five and dime in Rhinebeck, New York, and uh, a, uh, a man, a customer, uh, Henry, we'll call him, uh, he, uh, he continually uh, came in and shopped, and we exchanged our pleasantries and handshakes, and that was it, until one day he uh, came bearing a gift, uh, a package wrapped in brown paper, and I opened it up that night, 
And lo and behold, what was before me were the ten lost journals of Abraham Lincoln, which, you know, explain in his own words and handwriting uh, from his 12th birthday all the way up to the day of his assassination, his lifelong and, and uh, secret battle with the undead. Yes, sir, in the, in the very back. Yes, sir. Um, the, 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 the gothic tone of the book uh, is emblematic of, of Lincoln's own melancholy and his own obsession, by the way, with gothic literature and even the, the writings of Edgar Allan Poe, who he never met in real life but teams up with in this book just because I thought it would be fun. Um, and, uh, and, you know, if anything, um, the, you know, the gothic style of the book is, is emblematic of that, but then, you know, there is also a correlation between uh, the vampires in the book and the slaveholders in the book. Um, you know, they, we, it's explained in the book that sort of both of them are doing essentially the same thing, which is, you know, stealing the lives of others, the blood of others to enrich their, their own lives, to and further their own um, uh, lives and, and enrich their wealth. So, you know, that, that plays up and, you know, the, with apologies to my southern friends here, you know, some of the southerners in the book aren't portrayed so nicely, especially the slaveholders. Uh, and the slaveholders of the north, by the way, are not portrayed nicely at all. So uh, they're in league with the vampires in the book, and, you know, that's the theme that I kind of hit, hit over the head. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> the Johnny Depp question. Oh, I'm sorry. The, uh, the, question is, uh, the question is, because Tim Burton is, is one of the producers of the movie, should we expect then Johnny Depp to uh, be appearing as Abraham Lincoln? I don't know about Abraham Lincoln. Um, my, I, have a, I have a dream that, uh, that he plays Booth. <laughs> now think about it for a second. Uh, 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 handsome actor, mustache, you know, uh, right height, right build. Um, whoever does play, I mean, by the way, if Johnny Depp were to, you know, say, I want to play Lincoln, I would say, of course, you know, <laughs> it's genius, uh, and it would be, but uh, it, it's hard for me to think about who will end up uh, playing Lincoln, because when I was writing the book, and now I'm actually writing the movie for, for Tim and uh, the other producers, um, it's hard for me to think about anyone but the actual Lincoln. That's who I picture when I'm writing this, uh, when I wrote the book, and that's, who I picture now as I'm writing the screenplay, um, it's just hard for me to think of anyone else than the, you know, the, the, the Abe that we think of from the 1860s, the Matthew Brady portraits. Um, that's who I see. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I guess whoever ends up playing Abe, we'll have to make him look uh, uh, just like our 16th president. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. The question is, how much time, uh, percentage-wise, did Lincoln actually spend hunting vampires? Um, well, he, you know, he swears his vengeance against vampires when he is nine years old, uh, after the death of his mother, uh, originally thought to be from milk sickness, which, you know, would, one would get in the, on the frontier from drinking the, the milk of a cow that had eaten a poison root. Um, but uh, when Abe discovers that it was, in fact, a vampire who killed her, He's, he's, exactly. He swears vengeance. So that's nine years old. Now, he continues his fight against vampires in one way or another until the day he dies in 1865. Um, you know, he, uh, I would say, you know, especially when he's living in Illinois as a prairie lawyer traveling the circuit, vampire hunting is something he, he spends a great deal of his time doing. I can't put a percentage on it, but there's not a, re a week that goes by at some points that he's not out hunting uh, another bloodsucker. Uh, now, when he gets a bit older, when he gets a bit older, uh, he does retire for a time, uh, you know, and, and star starts to focus on his family again. But uh, then, lo and behold, destiny calls, and he has to dust off that uh, rusty old axe and get back to it. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's a good question. The question is, how does one hunt vampires? That's right. You, you've seen the duck calls, you know. No, you open a, uh, you, you, there's plenty of ways to hunt vampires. You can set up a fake uh, Red Cross tent. Um, in, the, uh, in the book, in the book, Abe is lucky enough to have, um, have a, for a mentor, a vampire. Uh, a vampire named Henry Sturges who, uh, who teaches him the, the secret history of vampires in America and in Europe, and who also, uh, through means that we may never know, 
supplies Abe with an endless supply of names and towns. Uh, and uh, Abe will receive a letter, uh, no matter where he is, whether he's living in Springfield, New Salem, whether he's in Washington, and Henry will send him a letter in the book, and it contains the location and the name of a known vampire. Uh, and Abe is then free at his convenience to, uh, to go to that town or that place and dispense of the vampire, which he does uh, better than just about anybody else. So, uh, yes, ma'am, in, uh, in the center. Well, I don't think that th the question is, what direct effect did the vampire hunting and the, uh, have on Abe's political life? I don't think you can separate the two, frankly. <laughs> think about that for a second. Um, I think that uh, Abe's, Abe's vamp in the book, Abe's vampire uh, um, hunting and his lifelong battle against the forces of vampires are what propel him into politics. So it had a massive effect. It's, it's actually at the behest of Henry Sturges that uh, Abe runs for the White House. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know. I think uh, the question is, is, is there, is there a, a cyclical nature to the popularity of vampires in literature and film? I think there probably, there, there probably is. There probably is. Um, I think my theory is that when times are tough, we turn to our favorite monsters. And uh, whether it's zombies, whether it's vampires, whether it's ghouls and ghosts, I think that horror as a genre um, becomes more popular in, in difficult and in, in stressful times because in a way, you know, and times have certainly been stressful, especially the last 10 years in this country and, and uh, you know, so socially, politically, economically. Um, I think we want the comfort of the boogeyman. Um, you know, we want, uh, we want to turn to the monsters we know aren't real because they distract us from the monsters that are. Uh, that's the best I can do in terms of an explanation. But, uh, yes, this gentleman and the uh, young gentleman here in the coat. Um, which was more difficult and which was more fun, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies or Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter? I think this, the new book, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, was more fun and more difficult. Um, I think it was more fun because it was more difficult. There was more uh, research involved. There was a uh, much longer writing period. Uh, you know, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies I wrote in six weeks uh, because I had to, uh, because that was the window that the publisher gave me for whatever reason. And um, so it was a mad dash to the finish line. And uh, I did outline it very thoroughly. I did read the original many times and make notes and I had all my characters plotted out, I had all my chapters plotted out, but when the actual physical writing uh, began, it was six weeks, and it was sort of painting over Austin's original manuscript, adding a line here, a word there, several pages at a time. Um, this was a, a bigger undertaking than that, because it wasn't just mimicry, it wasn't just you know weaving a story into a pre-existing story, it was starting on a blank page uh, and, and creating an entire narrative. Now, it still relies, it still has the training wheels of relying on a real history and a real man who had a real life and, and signposts along the way that I knew I needed to reach. Um, but uh, it was more fun because uh, I got to insert more of, of my own style into it and, uh, and got to play in uh, different uh, styles and different tones and, and got to uh, experiment with, you know, uh, things that Austin's manuscript didn't allow me to experiment in. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> wow. Gone with the brains, or, yeah, yeah. Um, no. <laughs> no. Although, you know, actually, there is a, there is a, um, you know, people ask about, well, how did you, you know, what do you feel about this mashup madness? And it's nothing new, this mashup craze that, you know, that now the marketplace is kind of flooded with, you know, it almost seems like people are just picking two things out of two different hats and combining them just to combine them in some cases without, you know, naming names or anything. But there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, you know, sort of weaker mashups, I would call them out there, and mashups for mashup's sake. Or, um, but uh, there was a book maybe 15 years ago, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, called The Wind Done Gone. You ever remember that one? And that caused quite a bit of controversy. And uh, it, was a, it was a shift in perspective of the original uh, novel. Now... Uh, Gregory Maguire does the same thing. He, you know, Wicked is just a perspective shift on The Wizard of Oz. And, you know, so in that sense, you know, finding a new way into a familiar story is nothing new. Um, I think what is new is this 
you know, absurd premise literature, this, you know, this meets that. Um, and uh, I don't personally think that this moment is sustainable. Uh, I think that people are going to sort of collectively start to roll their eyes if, you know, if I come out next with, you know, uh, Wuthering Heights Reloaded or something, you know. <laughs> um, which I'm, you know, and for that reason, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to keep uh, beating this horse. This horse is dead. Um, yes, another, another, uh, yes, ma'am. It will. Yeah, I actually, uh, I'm actually working on an outline for what's next. And, you know, it'll still have, uh, it'll still have those little winks at real historical moments. Um, it'll still have some of that pop culture feel to it. It'll still be supernatural, and I'm sure there'll be some, you know, some kind of gore in it somewhere. But, uh, but uh, I think that in terms of, you know, trying to become a better writer, in terms of trying to have a career that, you know, has some longevity to it, um, I'm, I'm looking to move into storytelling, writing a novel as opposed to, you know, writing a gimmick. Uh, now, I think that Abraham Lincoln reads as a novel. I think that it, re it, it starts as a gimmick, but I think that once you finish it, you realize that it is a story. It's its, it's, its own story, and there's, um, there's a lot more to it, I think, than just the, the title promise, or, or at least I hope there is. But... Uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think I'm going to, uh, you know, combine uh, Shakespeare and werewolves or whatever. You know, I think, that, I think that's a, a short-sighted uh, view. Because I think that the, you know, the moment, the mashup moment is already starting to pass us by. Uh, yes, I, I'm not really involved. I'm not writing the screenplay. Um, uh, Lionsgate uh, is making Pride and Prejudice and Zombies into a movie. Natalie Portman is one of the producers, and she's starring as Elizabeth. David O. Russell who um, made I Heart Huckabees and uh, Three Kings and other movies, uh, is writing the screenplay and directing the movie. I'm a co-producer of the movie, but, you know, in Hollywood speak, that means, you know, congratulations, now get out of our way. Uh, yeah, uh, see you at the premiere is, is basically what that means. So, uh, so I'm thrilled, like, I'm happy to step out of their way and let them make a great movie. They're, they're talented people, and, uh, but I'll be a little more involved in, in and Abe, I'm writing uh, the screenplay right now. Uh, anyone? Yes, sir. Well, Jeff Goldblum. Now that's a, That's an inspired choice, sir. That is an inspired choice. Mary Todd Lincoln, bless her soul. This gentleman, clearly full of rage toward uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. She was crazy, you know, she, I, how could a, a southern girl turn out, you know, to be such a, uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. But uh, Mary does play a role in, 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 uh, in the sense that uh, she marries Abe and goes crazy. Um, she is not a, uh, a bloodsucker, however, in the, in the book. Sorry, to, no spoilers there. Anyone, uh, yeah, you have another question, sir. Uh, Nothing, because I didn't write Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters. The question is, uh, the, the, what changed for me? I, I'll, but I'll I answer your question differently. Um, the, the question is, what changed for me in, in between Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters? Now, a lot of people think I wrote Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters. I did not. A very nice man named Ben H. Winters wrote that book. It is the same publisher. It's the same design. It's the same idea. Uh, but, uh, but it's not me. And, uh, I, but my life after Pride and Prejudice and Zombies came out changed dramatically. Um, and it's not even been a year yet. Pride and Prejudice and Zombies came out on April 1st uh, of 2009, and here we are on the 17th of March, and uh, you know, I'm talking about my second book with, with you fine people here in Atlanta. But you're not alone, and I'll tell you why. It's because I would say at least half the people that um, I talked to asked me that question. Because, you know, there was a, I think that, I don't think that the publisher necessarily went out of their way to make people believe that I had written that book, but they certainly didn't go out of their way to make people think that I, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't clarify uh, um, vehemently. So, you are not alone, sir. Um, yes, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Five question countdown. So, this is number five. Yes, ma'am. Bless her heart. Thank you. The, it's advice that I, if I say bless her heart after anything I say, I can get bless their heart. Bless their heart. Um, sir, bless your heart. 
All right, four to go. Yes, Trinity Lorino. If I could meet Abraham Lincoln and ask him any question, what would that question be? Wow, that is a James Lipton question. That is an actor studio question. If I, um, and my favorite cuss word? No, I'll pass on that one. Um, the I would probably ask him. Uh, oh, that's a great one. Now I'm taking it very seriously now because I'm getting back into my serious Lincoln mode and not my vampire Lincoln mode. And I, I want to think about. I'll, I'll come back to that one. I'm going to think about it, but I will answer it before I leave. The third to last question in the meantime belongs to a hand. Yes, ma'am. In Lincoln's time, were vampires organized or unorganized? They changed in Lincoln's lifetime. In the early days of his life, they were largely unorganized. Um, out there, you know, they're, they're, a, uh, they're a, uh, a lone wolf by, by nature, you know, because there's competitive, they're competitive. They're, you know, there's, so, there's only so many necks out there. And, uh, and so they, they competed against one another. But as the turbulent uh, 1850s come upon us and things start to shift into this side versus that side, vampires tend to fall along those lines and they do uh, organize one side um, sort of pro-man and one side sort of pro-vampire. The second to last question belongs to the man all the way in the back. The comment is, and I think we should all take it to heart, is that we should look more at Cassius Clay, the, uh, the pro-emancipation Cassius Clay, not the... Uh, yes, yeah, um, not uh, the future Muhammad Ali Cassius Clay, but uh, duly noted. That's, uh, you know, there was only, uh, there, I didn't run across much in my, you know, two-month cra crash course of Lincoln lore, uh, but it's worth checking out, absolutely. And the last but not least question for this evening, before we sign some books and have some fun together, uh, belongs to this uh, miss in the, uh, in the green shirt for St. Patty's Day. Um, the question is, did I enjoy Austin's work or, you know, or not when I was writing? Is that my, that's, um, I'm a great admirer of Jane Austen's work. And I think, uh, I, I don't think the book would have worked if I hadn't been. Um, I think that you have to admire your subject, even if you're satirizing them. Uh, imitation is a serious for, a sort of form of flattery, in, you know, but that's, uh, you know, I admire Abraham Lincoln, I admire Jane Austen, and uh, they're both brilliant in my book, and, and, uh, and I don't think that it's, you, you can't spend this much time and effort working on something if you don't like it, I, or at least I can't. Um, if I thought that Pride and Prejudice was awful, it wouldn't have been any fun for me whatsoever to, uh, to put uh, zombies in it. It's because it's so incredible that it's fun for me to sort of, you know, play with the themes and crank them up to 11, you know, and, and which is essentially what I did with that book. Um, so, no, I, I you know, I, I'm, Abraham Lincoln's been the centerpiece of my life now for almost a year, uh, and that would be unbearable, I think, if I didn't really admire the guy. And to that, uh, to that end, to answer your question about what I would ask Abraham Lincoln if I had a chance, I would probably ask him if he had read my book. And with that, I want to thank you all so much for coming, and I'll see you back there. Thank you. Hey, bless your hearts.